George Bruno for the 21 Report at the 21 Convention Patriarch Edition. And I'm talking with Mike Cernovich. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, my pleasure. Yeah, so we were just chatting a little bit before this about uh, Guerrilla Mindset, which mm -hmm. is a book that came out when? 2015, summer 2000, 2015, yeah. Yeah, and I had mentioned it to my followers and uh, I, I have it as an Amazon link mm -hmm. and it is probably one of the only things one of the only affiliate links that I have that just sells month after month after month. It's so relevant. Describe Gorilla Mindset. It's a great question because the book, as you know, you read it, it's quite complicated. It's part of my life story, part about money, part about health and fitness. And what I wanted to do with the book is take someone and give them a, a workbook for life, a blueprint for life, for, for basic and that you can apply always at a more advanced level. And I thought, okay, what is what is it about emotions? What is an emotion? What causes emotion? I would think about this all the time where I, would, I was driving a motorbike action in Vietnam as I was finishing the book and I just felt really angry. I had no reason to be angry at all. Nobody I hadn't gotten a fight with my wife and money was good, everything was good. And then you realize that emotions are flowing around in us all the time. Why, why is that? And usually it's because we're not mindful of it, we're not purposeful of it, we're letting this sort of cosmic soup bubble over without any kind of deliberateness yep. or attentiveness to it. And so much of the book is about just being more mindful of the emotions and realizing you can direct these emotions in a positive, aspirational way. Yeah. Because I love anger. I, I've always told people, if you're a man and you're not angry, then I don't want to talk to you because that means you don't have any intensity. Because yeah. I can work with anger, yeah. focused intensity. Yeah. I can't work with the people, oh, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Fool, kind of dejected, they don't have that fire inside. The despair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's just not my vibe. Yeah. And with gorilla mindset, it's more like you, it isn't how to be an aggressive gorilla. It's more right. like you feel that rawness inside of you. Yeah. And we need to control that. We need to focus that. Yeah. I like that. I, I remember hearing about a young boy, seven or eight years old in Philly, walking the streets with his father and he saw homeless people on the sidewalks and the little boy said, Dad, why are these people here? Like, like this shouldn't be this way. And uh, he was angry. This eight-year-old boy was like mad. And they started a thing called Trevor's House where they feed the homeless and rehabilitate who they can, get them back on their feet, give them a second chance, that kind of thing. And anger was the seed of that great work called Trevor's House because it was channeled in the right direction. Yeah, anger is energy. That's what people don't understand. Some people like being angry because they feel like that's fuel and that's the wrong approach too. Yeah. The right approach is that focused aggression, focused energy. Most people, they get the law and people go, oh, you look angry because they've never met me. If you meet me, I mean, you've hung out with me, you've been talking. I don't I'm a walk around angry, but if you just look at me, yeah. Whenever by myself, I look kind of like a yeah. insane person, right? Yeah, yeah. Because you're always you're always channeling that focus, and Absolutely. focus in your intent. Well, you have a lot of things going on um, with Gorilla Mindset. Um, I do find that it addresses the whole person. Uh, I was we were talking prior to this about how one of the uh, things that really spoke to me was I was the guy that always bragged about, hey, I only need six hours of sleep and a nap. And in your book, you talked about it's not cool. You really do need more sleep for regeneration and so forth. And I took that to heart because I felt like you were talking to me. And when I started actually getting eight hours of sleep a night and more, if I could, I actually felt better and didn't need a nap. Yeah, and your, skin lo well, and your skin looks great. You're very refreshed and that's a good night's sleep. People ask me, people assume that I never sleep. They go, oh, how much do you sleep? I go, as much as I can. Right. You've clearly never read my book. And they go, well, how do you get so much done? Right. Because I wake up and the minute I'm up, I'm on it. Yeah. I'm on it. Okay, I do my brain warm up and I'm ready to go. Yeah. And then all day, and when I go to bed, I'm tired. I sleep eight or nine hours a night. I have a whole routine. I, I love it. And there is this bravado about, and, and this is so much of society too, and, and men in particular, bravado kind of about bullshit. Yeah. Oh, I abuse myself. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, so you're going to die early. You're going to have a higher cortisol levels. Right. You're going to be less attractive and less focused. It's been proven that sleep deprivation is equivalent to a DUI, driving a DUI. Right. Uh, if you have chronic sleep deprivation. So when people say, I go, why are you bragging basically about being an idiot? Brag about some kind of accomplishment. 
And, and that's part of the book. And then uh, the most controversial chapter, oddly, was the chapter on money because there's not really, it didn't really fit. But I thought, well, there's a lot of people maybe didn't know this. I had to learn it and I threw it in there. And I've had all kinds of people actually, especially you know, professional people like you, say, I didn't even know about a self-employed IRA. I didn't even know all this stuff. Yeah. So, so one of my stronger fan bases are people who they just liked me, they bought the book, yeah. and they didn't even know about all this tax stuff that I yeah. put in the book. Yeah, very helpful stuff. I found it to be just a great all-around book, and I'll probably end up putting the link for it down below so you can get it as well. Um, so you're an author? And a filmmaker as yeah. well. Tell us about your latest work. Yeah, I made a movie because people always ask me, why do you make a movie and a book? So I'll skip ahead to that question, which is everybody in L.A. and New York, every douchebag comes to town, I'm going to make a movie, I'm going to write a book. They never do. Yeah. I go, okay, I'm going to be the douchebag who actually writes the book that yeah. does well, and yeah. I'm going to make the big movie. Yeah. And I made a movie on free speech, which actually had Candace Owens before she was a big deal and all these earlier people before they really blew up. But the production wasn't there, and I felt like I left something on the you table. You had Candace Owens before she was Candace Owens. Yeah, Dave Rubin what, before he was Wasn't she Rubin. Red Pill Black yeah, at well, one point? Yeah. She disappeared. At the time, she was being attacked by everyone. Yeah. And then I saw this person being marginalized by the left and the right. Everybody hated her. Yeah. And I could just feel that charisma. And I go, yeah. she's going to be powerful one day. I don't know if she'll be a lefty or righty or whatever. I'm, yeah. I'll be the one guy who's nice to her whenever right. everybody's mean right. to her. Right. And I go, so I, she was like, well, who, who is this guy? And then she met me and she goes, yeah. wow, I Googled you and you were apparently this like really evil guy. I'm like, I know, it's fake news. Right. And then she disappeared. Yeah. She comes back as Red Pill Black and now she's on her own journey, her own hero's journey, I guess, yes. in a sense. And so with Silenced, I felt like, you know, we just didn't, we didn't have the production value. It looked like kind of a PBS News Hour special. Yeah. Well, I want to just kill it. I right. want to have an amazing film that if I never do another film again, I can think I, I made a real movie, and that's what we did with Hoaxed. Some of the testimonials that I've seen are, it's the best documentary I've ever seen. I mean, I've seen that over and over and over. No, it objectively is, and I can tell you why. I was the producer, not the director, so I gave a very, I said, here's what we kind of cover, and yeah. I used my network to get people like Jordan Peterson in. So I'm very good at getting people in before they blow up and they're yeah. too important for me. Yeah, so at yeah. the time, Jordan Peterson agreed to hoax right. and he's never linked to it or he pretends he wasn't in it. Right, right. He, I was bigger than him. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm very good. Oh, this is this guy's on the rise. I can kind of tell it's the yeah. vibe or the aura. And so we got him in, we got Scott, Scott Adams in. And then I, I told the guys, okay, you do your thing. They were, it was about six months post-production. I'm like, guys, we got to, I get Kickstarter backers, dude. They're nipping at my heels. We got to do something. Yeah. So I'm driving actually for a Kickstarter dinner with some of the bigger backers. Toronto goes, oh my God, I just saw the rough cut of hoaxed. It is so good. So I pull over to a gas station and I'm watching on my iPhone and I go, oh my God, this is the best movie I ever watched. And for me, I have a hard, hard time watching movies because a movie has to be more interesting than Twitter. Yeah. And how often do you watch a movie that's better than Twitter? Right. Right? That's right. the test. Right. And I, I pulled her out. I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be late to this dinner. I have to go. And, and I said, okay, so then we have a hit on our hands. And then I became a little bit more evolved, and mm -hmm. we got to cut it down and other things. So, I, yeah, I can, I can say that with pride because the directors made the movie. I just produced it. How many hours of uh, footage do you have? Yeah, hundreds, 4K. And you, and you brought it down to? Two hours and eight minutes. Yeah. And that, the, guy, the rough cut was two hours and 45. Yeah. And we could have done a whole series. Yeah. We could have done six episodes. We weren't really big in the Vietnam War and everything. Right. And then I told the guys we got to have another two hours. And yeah. there was some back and forth. And finally, that was, I go, I'll let them have their two hours and eight minutes. It's almost painful making footage hit the floor. You know, it's like, it's like losing a limb, like such valuable footage. Yeah, and we had, so then we started releasing the full interviews, Jordan Peterson, Scott Adams, but I didn't yeah. know this because I'm not a cinematographer. Yeah. It takes a week to render some of the, these interviews. Yes. I, I was, when the guys told me, because they shot on a red camera and a yeah. so black magic, yeah. they go, oh yeah, it's going to be a week. I go, a week? They go, oh yeah, just to render it. Yeah. So I, I definitely learned a lot about shooting a real film versus sure. what I'd done before, more of an iPhone documentary. Right, right. And people should do iPhone documentaries, by the way, too. That's, that's part of the gorilla mindset. People go, oh, I want to make a movie. I go, okay, show me your demo reel. Well, I don't have mm -hmm. a demo reel. Why? Because mm -hmm. you have a red camera. You need mm -hmm. a $30,000 camera to mm -hmm. shoot a film. Yeah. You need a 4K. You need every 
every bell, you need a light box? No, you don't. Yeah. If, if you're not out there on an iPhone making it happen, because that's what I did. My first documentary was on iPhone. Right. Low budget. I made no money off of it. We did yeah. it on probably, I don't know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 or something. Yeah. Because the director, that, that's another story. But so I tell people, just get started. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, there's no, people have the sense that unless they can do it, like, you know, because you like fountain pens, and I love fountain pens too. But when you were giving your talk on the fountain pen, I thought about how many writers who said, oh, I can't write, I don't have the fountain pen and the paper and yeah. everything. No, that yeah. it's not the fountain pen keeping you. Right. I like nice things, but it's not the, you know, not, you don't have a red camera, or, your, or it isn't that you have a fountain pen. Right. You just, there's something else missing. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we have author, filmmaker, uh, you have done some political commentary as well. Journalist. I made a Journalism. Congress resigned. And uh, you observe things. Mm -hmm. You see through things. Where do you get that, what I would call, like superpower from? From, um, so here's what Wayne Gretzky did. He, when he was learning how to, he was a little kid. Yeah. He would watch the hockey games yeah. at night and he would trace on a notepad where the puck was yeah and he would just do this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and then he was uh, the, he did more assists than most people ever have points in hockey and they go well how are you so good he goes i don't skate to where the puck is i skate to where it's going yeah so for me i knew candace owens was going to be huge i knew jordan peterson was going to be huge right. when he was dming people probably dm he dm'd everybody you know to promote his book and things and the only reason, because I've just been so engaged and studied so many historical figures and studied people who really made it happen, inspirational people, you know, like the Arnold Schwarzenegger life path, the, that's the beauty of America. So you, you, when you watch enough people and you look at their trajectory, then you just get an intuitive sense, okay, here's where it's going to go. And right. you read history, philosophy, and you realize that when you read the old books, you realize, oh, the problems aren't new. Yeah. Right? The, once you get past the racism or whatever of Aristotle, and you know, because slavery, it was a different time, but mm -hmm. the idea that categories of thought, clear thinking, logical thinking, fallacious thinking, most people are speaking fallacies. You learn about mob rule and democracy. The Greeks were having these same conversations that we had. They didn't call it the Electoral College, or the Romans, they called it the Senate. They had their own anti-democratic system. And if you're, you know, you're reading all that, then eventually you go, oh, wow, there's no, this is not new here. This is, this is the same as it's always been. It just looks different. Yeah, yeah. More importantly, you are a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. Father of how many? Two. Two. Yeah, we did a home birth for the second one. That's magnificent. First one in the midwife, two daughters, yeah. And here you are at a patriarch conference. Yeah, there's, I, I tell people that, because I'm 41 now, yeah. and I waited till I was, I don't know, 38 or something, yeah. depending on how the dates worked, and I'm glad I did it both ways. I did the the thing, the selfish thing, and now I'm doing the parenting thing, which although people say it's unselfish to be a parent, as every parent will tell you, you get so much joy and fulfillment out of it. Yeah, it's kind of sure. silly to say it's unselfish because yeah. it's a very fulfilling, it's the most fulfilling work that I've ever done. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that say, and I, I find this, uh, and we talked about this, like there's so much despair, and, um, and I promise that I won't say these words again because you know I don't, I'm not a big fan of the glossary, but the manosphere, when I talk to people in the manosphere, there is a despair, a darkness. Oh no, I would never, I would never bring a child into this world the way it is. And I'm thinking, wow, you, it's never been a good time to bring children into the world. And to me, that's the ultimate selfishness and despair and depression and darkness. And here you brought two children into the world with optimism. Um, you are very family centric. Give hope to the guy who's who has talked himself into thinking that this that we shouldn't bring a child into this world. Yeah. So my answer to that is a little bit more nuanced because I, I got away from that world years ago because I just got tired of the negativity and the nitpicking. Yeah. And then I meet these guys and I go, okay. So before I had children, because I believed maybe we shouldn't have children, there's some issues, yeah. but I was in like great shape, making money, running businesses, great dating life and stuff. Yeah. So the people who have that despair are kind of losers, to be quite honest. It, yeah. isn't, it isn't winners, it isn't people with, with optimism for yeah. life and they're just killing it and they're like, you know what, I'm gonna go do my squats, my deadlifts today and then I'm gonna have a great dinner and meet beautiful women and hang out with my friends and everything's yeah. great. Yeah. 
and that's, but I don't want to give that up to have kids. Right. These are people that are just, they're just negative about anything. Right. And my message of optimism to people is fortunately based on the truth, which is that there's never been a time in the history of the world, and this is the problem, these people don't learn history, study philosophy. Unless you were born to a noble family, this is the Western world, there are people probably in India and Pakistan, it's a little more complicated there. But unless you were born in the Western world, there was never a time where you could just be like a regular guy and live a life that people would find unimaginable. There was, you'd be a serf or a peasant, you, there'd be all these loyalty pledges and people could send you off to do whatever you want to do. There's never been a time where you go, I'm just going to figure shit out. I'm just going to figure out my life, I'm going to take fucking charge of shit yeah. and make it happen. Never yeah. in the history of the world. Right. So the, all these guys are like, oh, I wish I grew up in another time. Like you'd have been steamrolled back then, right? Yeah. You're a pussy today, yeah. right? Yeah. But do you think you're going to yeah. go back and be in Sparta? Oh, God, no. Yeah, get yeah. out, get out of yeah. here. And, and by the way, the, the Spartan lifestyle is more idealized probably than it was. Can you right. imagine the injuries that you, I read? Oh, what was the book, the historical fiction of the Battle of Thermopylae? Uh, well, you know, we can put the link in the below, but right. the, the beauty of the book is how it goes into the details of the training and how much you just must hurt. Yeah. Because, you know, you go do squats and deadlifts and you're limping around the other day. Yeah. They're doing that all the time. Yeah. They were pushing each other into trees, the whole lines of people flowing their trees and stuff. And you think, yeah, you would just have knots everywhere. And right. It's like they had acupuncture or something. You would just be in some kind of chronic sure. pain every day of your life. And then these people want to sit around and cry all day or nitpick in the comments and stuff. And yeah. I just, the way I view it is I'm glad that there are people who want to reach some parts of society, mm -hmm. but I just don't care. I don't have time for that. Yeah. I look at it this way. There's more for me then. <laughs> well, I, you do great work and there's a lot of people doing great work. I think what happens though is because your audience shapes you. Yeah. And this is something that people don't understand. You think that when you get into this world that you're just going to tell people what to do. But then you have a stimuli coming back, and then your audience shapes you. Right. So me, I'm okay. I'm like, well, the, the, the vibe's bad, right? Right. So I don't, I don't want to be around the vibe because that's going to shape me and shape my messaging. Right. And, well, I better not say this because then that might offend someone. Yeah. And it becomes even more complicated when you become sort of a whatever public figure. Sure. And then you have everybody in, you know, with all the landmines that you can hit yeah. today where you're getting banned yeah. and, and everything else. But there is, I, there really is never been, and this is, you can agree, there's never been a better time in the history world to be born a man. Right. Ever. Women, too, they just can't get advice, right? Right. Now, I always think men like to complain. I feel worse for the women because there, there is no, again, I don't like the term males here, but there is no, like, just women giving each other advice like, hey, you don't have to have kids, but just FYI, if you want to, you ought to do it before you're, like, 33. It isn't like you can find a man at 35, your right. fertility, you're going to have real problems, man. Right. So if you want to just yellow it and dance on tables, great, no yeah. judgment. Yeah. But there's repercussions of that. There's yeah. no, nothing like that for women. That's right. Whereas with men, I can say, look, if you want to be pathetic and go, you know, cry yourself to sleep, go ahead and do it, right? Mm -hmm. But there's all these different pathways and different men living different kind of lifestyles. I mean, you have more. I mean, you have Mormons, right? There's Mormons here, yeah. And then you have kind of, you know, scumbags or you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you, there's all these different paths for yeah. men that it's never been like that before. Yeah. And then they they kind of like want to mope around, but for women, they're only getting a uni message, which is you gotta you got I mean, think think about this too. Is um, you're you know, you're a successful guy. Imagine somebody tells you, oh yeah, you got to go to college. You got to have a career. You got to find a man to settle down, and you got to have work-life balance yeah. all before you're like 25. Yeah, sounds absurd, right? Yeah. That's what they tell women. That's the yeah. messaging for women. Yeah. And then all these guys want to cry about women and all that. I'm like, well, I know, but a little, a little sympathy for them, a little empathy. They're at least you got the men can get good advice. Women mm -hmm. aren't getting any kind of good advice. Mm -hmm. On any given day when you broadcast live, you're rolling the dice. Sometimes you have more people watching you than are watching CNN. And then other how do you, and, and how do you deal with that? Like, I've heard people say things like, um, like they're like, citizen journalists. And I'm like, yeah, citizen journalist. I mean, at least I can learn the truth from someone who's on the street with an iPhone and I'm watching it. I mean, I watched, I watched a guy get assaulted at an event that was being broadcast on an iPhone. A man that was doing nothing wrong. And I did follow the trial and so forth, and, and you know, you're familiar with that, that New York event and whatever. 
And I th no one else, no one anywhere reported on it. And then the silencing of citizen journalists. Um, and they're now starting to have a voice legally. How do you feel about that? Yeah, live streaming is interesting because I pioneered the idea that you just show up and just show people. Just, yeah. sh just show people. Yeah. Now everybody's doing it, which is great because yeah. it is dangerous. And the issue is that I had anyway is when you have all those live viewers and they see the count thing, your brain starts to spin. It does yeah. rewire your brain yeah. in a way that I had to learn to manage and modulate. Right. Because it's like a high, it's like adrenaline. Right. There are that many people, and then you feel like you have to say something, and then as you know, when you're in a stimulated response, your impulse control goes down, yeah. and you're live, and you're like, well, you, but you gotta be careful what you say still, and right. so then you have to learn, you know, learn to dial it down a little bit. And the media, of course, they hate that because there's no, there's, there's a scene in hoax. This is the, the most proud work I've ever done in this, I stream this live at the DNC. So they go to the RNC, Oh, there's all these people walking out of the Trump thing. No, there wasn't. There, just, just, there wasn't. 10 or 20 Ted Cruz truthers threw a yeah. little bit of a fit, and yeah. it was nothing. Media, wall to wall. Right. Something like 1,500 delegates at DNC walked out because of the way Bernie Sanders was treated. Mm. And I'm out there streaming. A man in a suit walks out. Anybody who walked out of this is anti-Hillary, hates Democrats. All the cameras go around him, and then there's a Bernie delegate. Yeah. And nobody, no media there. Yeah. So I start yelling, literally yelling at the, the people at Bernie. I go, look at this right now, because I'm streaming live. I go, look at this. This is the narrative in real time. This is propaganda in real time. Yeah. The media's going to pretend like they're Bernie people that don't exist. And then all the cameras like, went over to her and started talking yeah. to her. And that's why they hate us, because that's how you shape a narrative. The narrative is, is real simple. In any given situation, there are 100 things you can talk about. Yeah. 10 good, 10 bad, the rest kind of blah. Right. The media will only focus on two or three bad things. Right. Pretend like there's nothing else there. Right. So if the media covered this event, you know, they would wait around until somebody got drunk and made a bad joke. Right. And then that would be the story of the event. Sure. It wouldn't be the fathers and the prayer bro. It'd be none of that. Right. And that's what they, and when they do it on a small thing, they, that scales up and that's what they do with politics. They, they set the narrative and if, and if you're just right there live streaming, who are you gonna believe me, edited, you know, edited TV, or are you gonna believe the live stream that you can watch right now and interact with in real time? The, the real breaking news is from an iPhone, not from a news organization. Yeah, and you can get there faster. But why do you need, and Tim Pool talked about that, he was in hoax, he's huge now too, so that's another, sort yeah. of, that was a good get. It's funny, because I always think when I do a film and it's done, how many people who are in my film could I get today? Yeah. And I couldn't get Candace Owens again. I right. couldn't get Jordan Peterson again. Right. Probably couldn't get Tim Pool again, right? right. And so then, then the next project, I want to think, well, I wonder who I can get now before I... That's how you always want to look at things. Yeah, yeah. Is you be want where to, the puck is going to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, excellent. Well, I, it, it's interesting. You can choose to see the glass half full or see it half empty. I tell guys that are going through breakups, even though a breakup is very, very subjective for a man who's going through a breakup and I joke around and say, you know, there's three billion women in the world and you're worried about one. And you talk about, you know, there's eight other things, but the focus on the two bad things. Uh, and that becomes the news story. And I find that um, you end up focusing on positivity, hope, optimism, and that's kind of like my message. And I think that's why so many people are drawn to you. And I think that's one of the polarizing things is that you offer hope and optimism and positivity to people. And there's people that are actually trying to stop a positive message. Dude, that's the biggest surprise of all of this is, I wish somebody had sat me down when I was like 35 and say, hey, you don't have to tell bad jokes to troll people. Be really positive, you'll actually draw more hate yeah. being positive. Yeah. I wish that, because it's, it's just objectively true. I'm like, these people are snipping at me. I'm like, I don't even do anything. I'm super nice, super positive. Right. And it makes them angrier. Right. And then you realize from the mindset work and everything else that it's the concept like state matching. So if you're happy, you want everybody in the room to be happy. Yeah. If you're mad, you want everybody to be mad. And when you see somebody happy, that actually makes you angrier. It right. spirals you out of control. Why is this person not angry right. like I am? And I sort of talk about like the smiling chimp. Like I'm just a smiling chimp. They're screaming at me and I love yeah. you so much. Yeah. Namaste. Or even people yeah. show up in real life. I'm like, I love you. Thank yeah. you. And they get, then they get even angrier. Yeah. Whereas if I got in their face or something, they would feel like they won because there's, there's a concept. There's language we use. That's what I always tell people to be mindful of is 
metaphors and how the metaphors are embedded in our, deep into our psyche, and one of them is bring them down to your level, right? And we, know, and we all know that. Oh, yeah, you're right. This guy's just a bad person. They want to bring you to a level. And then that's great, but we, we should find the aspirational metaphor. Why don't we try to be at a high level and bring people up to our level? Mm-hmm. So when everything is duality, bring you down to your level, I'm always thinking, well, let's have a more positive aspirational thing. And that's where the, the, I call it the men's internet or the men's corner of the internet goes is there's too many people destitute and in despair because some truths about reality are a little bit sad. Right. Um, it, it's sad that I'm going to die. I, I think about that sometimes, especially not, before I had kids, I didn't care. Yeah. Before I had kids, it was like YOLO, you know, riding yeah, the right. bikes in Vietnam. Who cares, right? Sure. As long as you don't get really bad injured or something. And then you have kids, you're like, oh man, probably when that DMT hits me, I'm probably going to see my kids and it's going to probably be a very intense and very maybe traumatizing experience as I'm dying or whatever. And then I start to, this is a very sad thing to focus on. But... The duality of that is, but that means if you don't want to die, it means you want to live, right? So yeah. why don't you focus less on the a- a- impact of, okay, so this means that I enjoy life. So what is it about I enjoy about life? And how can I build up that better, more aspirational life? And that's where men today go wrong. Is I see guys complaining. I'm like, dude, you're better looking than I was at your age. You know, like you're in good, sh- you're I'm like, you have good raw material. That, yeah. With some of these guys I could get, I'm like, yeah, I mean, didn't get a fair shake, right. you know, I could k- kind of get it. I right. don't think anybody should think that way, but I can at least kind of get it. Mm-hmm. And then I meet these kids, I'm like, wait, you're like, uh, physically you have raw material. If you went mm-hmm. to the gym for a year, you'd mm-hmm. be pawed on. And that's because they focus on the despair and oh my God, the, mm-hmm. the women are so broken and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But the idea though, if the women are broken, which I think the men are broken too, and, and that's kind of the issue with everybody is, that means that you get to pick and choose who you want, who isn't. And then if men are broken, then that means you're going to be a top commodity and that's where people should focus their masculinity. And I think that's where 21 Convention and other people are realizing that too. The puck is going towards positive masculinity that doesn't tell you you have to live for women. Yeah. Right? You should meet a woman. I love my wife. I adore her. She's, she has so much joy in my life. It's unquestionable. But to meet someone like that you can't be some guy who thinks, oh, I just have to save someone. This, right. Oh, I need to... S-. No, 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 you, no, no, no. Right. Your, your duty as a man isn't to save right. people from their poor financial choices, their, their poor emotional choices. That's not your duty as a man. Your duty as a man to live a life that's positive and aspirational, and then when you do that, then you're allowed to choose. Yeah. So for me, I just wake up with so much optimism, and I can't... Even when I'm going through bad times, because, you know, you run businesses, you hit... Cash flow crunches. It isn't always fun. That's right. The IRS says, oh, you know, you undercounted and, you know, there's always something. Mm-hmm. But I have the fundamental belief, which is based in reality, that you're always going to be able to find a solution. It might not be today. It might be three, four, five right. years. But you, even if you have a, you know, a bad condition, right? I had really bad skin condition. afflicted me for years. But I just knew that I, eventually I would get something or stem cells. And, and after years of suffering, yeah, I actually found something. Hmm. You know, it's funny, one of my favorite YouTube channels is Masculine Geek, and it's up and coming. It's, I'm kind of, I would like to think that that is where the puck is going to be, and it's three guys, one from Jersey, Salt Lake City, and Seattle, and they talk about old typewriters, antiques, games, painting miniatures, (laughs) you know, the geek stuff. And I don't view them as any less of a man they're not about TRT, deadlifting, picking up girls, that kind of thing. That kind of stuff bores them. And I'm finding it to be refreshing material, and I'm actually enjoying it. And uh, we're thinking of actually having kind of like a geek track here at 21, because I don't want the gamer guy, the skinny little dude, the guy that's not physically blessed, uh, and never will be. I don't want them to feel that they're not welcome here. That, you know, there's there's the impression that everyone here is like a Navy SEAL. And uh, masculinity is a spectrum of men. And uh, masculinity is also a spectrum. It's not all TRT and deadlifting and cold showers and that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's where the 
the leadership has to be shown is you know there's niche marketing without tribalism yeah so i see so many men like they try to they they go over oh, the the manly men and look at all these gigs so let's go over how about you just leave them alone yeah right that's my thing they're their little niche thing and yeah they're into steampunk is or uh, steampunk or whatever is getting big and they're into that like i'm not going to go there and tell them you're a bunch of pussies or something yeah, like, right, the hell's right. wrong with you right right but you see so much of that as war of the manly men and we do this and yeah. anybody else's niche markets are big and you're right one of the big trends that's going to happen is traditionally masculine activities that went away cigar lounges yeah. whiskey i have a podcast actually now where we do whiskey tastings things like that that kind of epicurean mm -hmm. is going to come in and so will the the hobbyist one of my favorite youtube channels is meteorology you know, like he takes an old you know butcher knife or something like that and restores it and there's something about the male brain that that yeah. appeals to you know like, yeah why why does it i don't know why yeah. it does but it, but there's that sense of tinkering so there'll be you probably you could probably start a youtube channel where you fix clocks yeah i've watched the ones where they put together the petit philippe watches yeah like, wow this is amazing and i watch four or five hours of those videos yeah. sometimes that's great stuff. so you're right those guys are, are definitely onto something yeah absolutely hope positivity and optimism conversation with Mike Cernovich. Thank you, sir. Thank you.